The music of the Brooklyn-based math metal band Carbomb is very rhythmically complex. A central goal and accomplishment of the growing field of metal music analysis has been detailed in robust theorization of rhythmic complexity, especially in cases of polymeter in the music of Meshuggah and rapidly shifting meter in the music of bands like Dream Theater. However, existing theories cannot account for Carbomb's rhythmic innovations, especially their play with tempo. I argue in this paper that these innovations necessitate a new approach to rhythmic surfaces, which I call rhythmic parallax. In its classical usage, stellar parallax refers to a technique for measuring the distance of stars based on measurements taken when the Earth is at different points in its orbit. Similarly, rhythmic parallax refers to a method of understanding a complex rhythmic surface with reference to multiple perspectives. According to this principle, different listeners construe even ostensibly basic features of the musical surface, such as tempo, in drastically different ways. In other words, I ask the question, tempo, but for whom? I will discuss four such perspectives. The perspective of a stylistically competent listener, the perspective of the band members while writing and learning to play the song, the perspective of the band members while performing after having rehearsed extensively, and the perspective of a transcriber, such as myself, using tools that measure the recording against clock time. These perspectives overlap, and I treat them as analytical heuristics more than as descriptions of actual people. When I speak of the compositional perspective, for example, I'm not claiming that the band ever thought about the music in this way at any point, but speculating that they might have, and arguing that someone hoping to write music in their style would likely think this way. I hope to show, in detail, how a single musical moment can be fundamentally different for different listeners, and for the same listener at different times, with a change of perspective. The idea of a plurality of perspectives on a given rhythm is not entirely novel. Indeed, Jonathan Kramer points out that creative listeners can apply almost any temporal listening strategy to almost any piece. However, discussions of this type of plurality appear almost exclusively in discussions of polymetric music. Kofi Agawu has explored several perspectives on the standard pattern in multi-layered Western African musical traditions. Mark Butler has described changes of metric perspective in electronic dance music, and Olivia Lucas distinguishes between moshers and counters in the exposition of her article on Meshuggah's polymetric riffs, just to point to a few examples from three very different repertoires. While the members of Carbomb are outspoken about their love for Meshuggah, and some of their music is similarly polymetric, my goal here is to describe situations that are not necessarily polymetric or even cyclical, but still allow for several rhythmic interpretations. My approach is founded on theories of embodied rhythm. Justin London synthesizes extensive evidence that the perception of rhythm and meter is intimately connected to bodily capabilities, and scholars such as Stephen Hudson and Marius Kozak have extended his fundamental insights. For these scholars, to varying degrees, musical time, including rhythm and meter, is something that people do rather than facts residing in a score or a recording. This insight is essential to my idea of rhythmic parallax. If, as Hudson convincingly argues, listeners stitch together feelings of beat and meter in real time out of a series of learned metering practices, it follows that different listeners might create different patchwork quilts when faced with the same musical surfaces. In other words, a single recording may have different rhythmic realities for different listeners. However, perhaps the two closest parallels to my current project can be found in Justin London's concept of the metric fakeout and in Nathaniel Hesselink's analysis of fan interpretations of the famously slippery rhythmic ostinato in Radiohead's Pyramid Song. London introduces the term metric fakeout to refer to situations in which a musical surface projects a certain metric interpretation only to have that metric interpretation undermined, usually by the entrance of drums. I will likewise posit that some of Carbomb's music intentionally invites illusory rhythmic interpretations, but unlike metric fakeouts, many of Carbomb's illusory rhythms are never explicitly resolved. Hesselink not only takes seriously the idea that the pyramid song ostinato may have different existences for different listeners, but posits that its ambiguous nature functions to invite fan engagement precisely because it allows a plurality of perspectives. My paper today examines a more complicated musical surface and a different set of perspectives, but I follow his example of taking each of them seriously. All of my musical examples will come from Carbomb's song Blackened Battery from their 2019 album Mordial. Here's a short excerpt that presents a clear instance of rhythmic parallax in which a casual listener likely hears tempo differently than the band does. <laughs> From 
from the perspective of someone familiar with metal music, but not listening with the intent of transcribing, analyzing, or learning to play this passage, I would wager that it sounds as if this passage has a steady tempo, with a tactus coinciding with a cymbal hits. Here's that section again. However, from the compositional perspective, this ostensibly isochronous beat becomes non-isochronous, a fast 5 plus 4 16th note construction. Here is the same passage slowed down, where the unevenness of the cymbal hits becomes more immediately audible. Carbomb's guitarist, Greg Kubaki, has said that this effect is intentional. Quote, We like to do a lot of stuff in 9-8, where we have a section of 4 16th notes and then 5 16th notes, so it feels like it's speeding up and slowing down with each shift. It's sort of an effect that makes it feel like the tempo is changing even though it's in a different time signature. End quote. While this describes the situation in the present example exactly, the broader idea that there might be a public-facing rhythmic character that is intentionally different from that what the band feels is central to my argument. In a sense, the band writes and plays finely crafted rhythmic illusions. This sort of rhythmic illusion is strikingly apparent when this pattern is briefly altered later. For a listener, this most likely sounds like an acceleration and then deceleration of tempo. However, from the composer's perspective, this is a change from a 916 meter articulated as 5 plus 4 to an 816 meter articulated as 4 plus 4 and then back to the 916. <laughs> Instead of actually fluidly changing tempo, the band makes the listener hear a changing tempo while they themselves think in terms of changing meters. However, despite talk of rhythmic illusions, I hope to avoid hierarchical interpretations of these different perspectives. I believe that dismissing the listener's perspective as illusory unnecessarily limits the discussion. Justin London's survey of cognitive research on rhythm and meter reminds us that hearing a slightly wonky but isochronous tactus in this excerpt may in fact be a perceptual default. 16th notes in this passage, at quarter note equals circa 146 BPM, last about a tenth of a second, which London identifies as the lower limit for a duration or periodicity to be incorporated into a metric framework. In other words, it is difficult for listeners to find and latch onto this common pulse, not only because the musical surface is complex, but because it is so fast that it is right on the border of what average listeners can even treat as metric. In the example just mentioned, the band hears shifting groupings of a fast isochronous pulse, while a listener hears a slightly unstable isochronous beat. In my next example, these roles are reversed. Here is another excerpt from Blackened Battery, in which it seems highly unlikely that a casual listener hears any isochronous pulse or tactus. <laughs> I posit that this lurching, shifting musical surface, while complex in its use of tuplets and grouping, is actually aligned to a steady eighth note pulse for the band. Here it is again with my transcription. rendering of my transcription with a superimposed metronome to approximate how the band might hear this section. (laughs) 
So far, my discussion of rhythmic parallax has dealt with complex rhythmic surfaces, but only two relatively simple perspectives on them. My final example is more complicated in that it requires positing two more rhythmic perspectives. That is to say, it is more difficult to say what is going on. Here are the song's first 20 seconds, in which, from the listener's perspective, there are no less than eight sudden tempo changes. <laughs> changing tempo hinges in large part on the changing rate of isochronous cymbal hits, sometimes allied with a backbeat, the characteristic meter-making pattern for most pop, rock, and metal. As Marius Kozak has noted in discussion of similar moments in Panzer Ballet's Giant Steps, the backbeat has the capacity to, quote, hijack the musical surface, unquote. In other words, listeners are so accustomed to this pattern's role as meter, or rather, its role as a cue for the types of movements such as headbanging that create meter, that they are quick to lock into it and follow its invitations for tempo and meter making. In car bombs music, even when we don't get fully articulated backbeats, isochronous cymbal hits are equally deeply entrenched as markers of tempo, and they hijack perception in the same way. Christopher Hastie's theory of meter as rhythm is more applicable to car bombs music than to most popular music because there is so much change in the rhythmic surface. Listeners are constantly in the process of gleaning not just new meters, but new tempi from this musical surface. I might hear a single cymbal hit or some other distinctive event, then another, and come to expect a third after the same time interval defined by the first two. If it materializes, voila, I have an invitation to move in a way that creates a new tempo for me. From a compositional perspective, these sudden tempo changes are of two types. First, Carbon's music is full of precise tempo modulations, in which a duration in a given tempo is reinterpreted to become a different rhythmic unit in a new tempo. This happens only once in Black & Battery's introduction, where a unit lasting 5 16th notes is reinterpreted as a dotted quarter note. Here, listeners hear a constant tactus rate at around 123 BPM, while the band must readjust the pulses subdividing this unchanging tactus from 5 to 6. Tempo modulations such as these occur at several other points in blackened battery. However, a second type of apparent tempo change results from a different technique and accounts for the majority of what listeners hear as tempo changes in the introduction and in the rest of the song. I call this technique pulse-preserving tactus modulation and it is one of Carbomb's signature techniques. To explain this technique, I must first clarify how I use the two terms. Following London, I use tactus to refer to the felt B, the periodicity to which listeners move. By pulse, I mean faster units that are grouped to create the tactus. Often these are called subdivisions of the B. In a pulse-preserving tactus modulation, what the listener likely hears as a tempo change is, from the compositional perspective, a change of how pulses are grouped into a tactus but not a change of the rate of pulse and not a reinterpretation of a rhythmic unit as in a classic tempo modulation. The pulse is still the pulse. I mentioned one moment like this earlier in the change from 916 to 816 to 916. Of the eight apparent tempo changes in the song's first 20 seconds, seven are pulse-preserving tactus modulations from the compositional perspective. First, there is a dotted quarter note tactus, which is changed to a tactus lasting for 5 16th notes. Then, after a true tempo modulation, in which the pulse rate changes, the tactus moves from 6 16th notes to 4, to 3, to 8, to 5, back to 8, and finally to 4. In pulse-preserving tactus modulations, because the preserved pulse is generally fast, a listener likely attends only to the changing tactus and not to the underlying constant pulse. Therefore, these moments sound like tempo changes. When we approach the musical surface as a composer might, however, these ostensible tempo changes are more economically thought of as a series of changings of groupings of a fast but unchanging pulse. I have so far argued that the band writes music that they perceive a certain way, but that exploits genre conventions and the average cognitive capabilities of listeners to be a substantially different rhythmic beast for their fans. However, the situation is actually even more complex. I will touch briefly on two more perspectives on the rhythmic surface. 
First, that of the well-rehearsed band, as opposed to the band writing or first rehearsing these songs. Again, this perspective is a speculation based on inferences from the musical surface, published interviews, and my own experiences playing in a progressive metal band. I posit that the performer's perspective is distinct from that of the band in the early stages of a song's existence. While writing these riffs or learning to play them to a click track for a scratch recording requires a certain type of calculated, meticulous conceptual hearing, there is a gradual migration that happens when the band starts playing together without a click track. Early, I speculate, the band members need to count to stay together and create the desired effect. Later, the feel of the structure becomes internalized and the focus shifts to playing and shaping the sounds together as a group. At this stage, I argue that the band actually begins to hear something like how listeners hear. In other words, they get a feel for the music and memorize the approximate tempo changes. From there, they inflect them expressively and collectively. Interviews with a band confirm that this subtle play of tempo, which comes from recording and performing without a click track, is central to their sound. Drummer Elliot Hoffman said as much in a 2017 interview, contrasting Carbomb with similarly technical metal bands. Quote, it's just me and Greg, the guitarist, in the studio. I play with him live in the studio when we are doing takes, and there's no click track or anything like that. It keeps it live, and it's like a roller coaster that goes up and down instead of being totally locked in. I feel like with music now, when it's locked to a grid, and they go in and edit all the drums to make it perfect, it sucks the soul out of it a little bit, you know? So we try to keep all of that intact, and it makes a huge difference in the vibe." End quote. Bassist John Modell concurs. Quote, we don't play to a click track live and keep that unpredictability of how our temples will all shape up, end quote. The sonic trace of this unpredictability is quantifiable with observations from one final perspective, that of the transcriber dealing with software that brings the song into conversation with clock time. This perspective reveals pervasive slight gradual fluctuations in tempo in addition to the instantaneous tempo modulations and slight differences between the studio version and live recordings. These fluctuations are especially pronounced in the song's introduction, where the same groupings of the pulse yield sometimes noticeably different tactus rates. In this section, the band exaggerates the tempo changes, making the fast ones faster and the slow ones slower. More striking is the difference between tempo 5 at 98 BPM and tempo 7 at 91 BPM for the ostensible same tactus grouping of eight pulses. I hear these discrepancies between the calculated and actual tempo as expressive shaping functioning on top of the sudden tactus changes. Here it is one last time. numbers on these observations is impossible without software that can objectively and precisely measure clock time in the recording, and may therefore seem to have questionable usefulness in a theory hoping to explain the experience of listening to Carbomb's music. Nevertheless, this perspective is important for at least two reasons. First, these observations point to a less quantifiable but supremely observable facet of the music, the subtle rhythmic play alluded to by the band members. In other words, we can take clock time measurements seriously if we posit that they are glimpses of real-life interaction between performers, the essential push and pull that gives the music its infectious, kinetic, slippery character. Second, this perspective undermines a tendency we might have to accord primacy to the implied compositional background structure. While that perspective allows for the most legible transcription, and may have been chronologically prior, is objectively another fiction, a perspective no more and no less valid than those of listeners, performers, or transcribers. I have argued in this paper for an approach to rhythmic analysis that acknowledges rhythmic parallax, taking seriously the plurality of ways that a given musical surface can be rhythmically construed. Carbomb's music, besides being thoroughly enjoyable, provides an example in which exploring these perspectives seems unavoidable. What a listener hears as a suddenly changing tempo, a composer may hear as a change of grouping of an unchanging pulse, while a performer and transcriber may hear approximations of this change of grouping and subtle shifts in the pulse rate. In fact, in my understanding, the music's rhythmic complexity is equivalent to its refusal to be understood exhaustively from a single perspective. However, I close by suggesting that the utility of the concept of rhythmic parallax is not limited to rhythmically complex music. I argue for a wider interpretation in which the differences in rhythmic hearing between listeners in various situations, including so-called mistakes of rhythmic hearing, can profitably be taken seriously. 
I'm not necessarily advocating for some sort of postmodern, anything goes relativist rhythmic analysis, as interesting as the results of such analyses might be. I am, however, advocating for analysis that takes seriously the reality that rhythmic surfaces can, and often do, sounds fundamentally different to different listeners, and I hope to open the door to embracing all of the complexities, difficulties, and apparent contradictions that come with this reality. Thank you for watching. Oh,